And a very good evening to you. Welcome along. It is Sunshine Meets this Sunday evening with Joe Harrington. And my very special guest this evening is a very, very interesting man, Dr. Patrick Tracy, probably best known as a a multi-award winning physician. He's a humanitarian. He's an entrepreneur. He's a world traveler and actually a father of aesthetic medicine. And delighted you could join us this Sunday evening, Patrick. Good evening, Joe. Now, uh, you have a book that's coming out sometime this year because you have a really, really interesting life. And if I say Michael Jackson, if I say Madonna, if I say Northern Ireland, if I say the Middle East, uh, you encompass the whole lot. But what I want to do is I want to start at the very beginning and talk to you a little bit about uh, you growing up. And we're going to try and also ask you to pick uh, some songs, some music that have made a big impact in your life. So, first of all, tell us a little about, you know, where it all began, Patrick. Well, I grew up in West Fermanagh in Northern Ireland and my earliest memories, I suppose, of that period would be my father, a garage and a bicycle shop. And I remember the farmers and all his friends coming in on the long winter evening sitting around a fire. This was a different era, Joe, and it was the crossover between what we think now is technology with young kids growing forward in the digital age. When I remember them sitting around the fire, they would have broken gramophone springs on the floor. They would have old car bed lamps from cars. So it is very much the analog age rather than the digital age. And this was a period when I suppose I would remember President Kennedy being shot and the utter dismay that it sort of had caused. And this was a day, time even before television. So they'd all be sitting around a brown HMV valve radio listening to the world events, Cassius Clay fighting Sonny Liston and the emotion it caused and people were much closer in, in commu- at that age mm. or at that, at that stage I suppose communities were, were much closer it was also a period unfortunately when Northern Ireland began to begin to kick off Martin Luther um, had shown I suppose the rise of civil rights in the United States and the same thing was happening in Northern Ireland and, uh, did, that, and did that ha- I mean, you were talking about <coughs> kind of the late 60s going into the times of when it really got intense and, and how did that impact probably the late 60s is right you know and I, I would remember um, I suppose in Fermanagh particularly there was a lot of discrimination um, out of 75 bus drivers there was only three Catholics in terms of, I suppose, the civil servants, there was about 400 employed in Enniskin and about 30 were Catholics. And the Catholics would have felt a deep sense of injustice um, regarding this period. And I went to Samagas College in Enniskillen, I boarded, but in the period that I came out to go to my first college, Queen's Belfast, it was around the time for the tit for tat murders in Belfast. And Queen's Belfast was adjacent to the village where all these people were, were getting killed. And I suppose uh, the student um, civil rights under Bernard Devlin that had a long association with Queen's Belfast. And I was associated with, um, uh, I suppose, a sabbatical year also in terms of student politics in Queen's. And it was very easy to get caught up in in the middle of all that. I was just going to ask you that because obviously before all this, uh, people, although it seemed maybe a little bit fragile, the piece was fragile, did live side by side. But as the troubles developed, were you you nearly forced to take sides? Well, in my father's garage, believe it or not, during the daytime, when I'd be there, I'd be working in it, we would have known IRA volunteers coming in to get punctures or tractors fixed on one side and the B-specials and the UDR regiment coming in on the other. So the both of them would be standing side by side over a puncture with my father in the middle fixing it, not talking to each other. And as soon as the sun go down, the both of them would go home, take out their rifles and start shooting at each other. Mm. And we're very conscious of this. And there would have been a lot of deaths in the area. And in my particular area, uh, I suppose the IRA... Um, uh, 13 or 14 families that were Protestant who were associated with uh, defence forces move out of the area. But once I went to college, I developed a very keen interest in medicine because I realised that um, I had won the Aer Lingus competition in Dublin uh, as biochemist of the year and I'd also won the amateur young scientist so you had an interest, yeah. in, in, in biochemistry. Okay. So when I started off, I did biochemistry originally. But then, um, I suppose, during the, the years in Queen's Belfast, as things started to heat up, we were at different halls of residence and um, a lot of, I suppose, um, prominent Catholics within the student union were targeted. And um, some were even killed. 
And um, during that time also, I suppose, I was attacked. And for I what got reason? Like, for why you... Well, the background to it w- was, was interesting to an extent. The different halls of residence started to, I suppose, formulate along tribal lines almost. Our committee in Allenbrook Hall was very Catholic, Synod Hall, and Livingstone was very Protestant. And those halls started to fly Union Jacks over, over the halls. And somebody, n- nobody that we knew, um, flew... Uh, um, tricolour o- over Allenbrook Hall and as a consequence some of our committee were sent bullets and then I, I was attacked one night and uh, got my legs broken wow. and Mm. It's it's a, a thing that we never thought of. Like a, a lot of people, sort of looking from the outside in, maybe thought it was a lot of working class areas that were battling, and it was, you know, there was a certain section of the so called upper classes that were yeah. totally untouched about from from the troubles. Well, in well, well, to an extent that is true at an economic level. In terms of the Malone Road, you certainly didn't have the problems that you would have down in the Falls. But still, at the same time, I suppose student politics is always the intersection between uh, in terms of political maturation. This is where, I suppose, political parties are formed. You'll even see it today in a lot of the Islamic sort of Dabani schools. Once they go to university, it's always the students who are in the streets, be it in Cairo, be it in the Lebanon, and was also the same in Belfast. Northern Ireland civil rights started in Queen's Belfast. You know, this is a time, I suppose, when everybody is idealistic, often left-wing in their thoughts before they earn their first yeah. wage and have to go out and face the world. But also, you know, they carry the spirit of fairness and anti-oppression. And as a consequence, I mean, some of the students actually, one person I know, Mickey Mallon, got hung over the lagging sure. bridge with a fish hook in his neck. And there was wow. two or three yeah. students that were killed in that so period. let me ask you, when that happened to you and you got severely injured, did you say to yourself, I, I can't stay here? Or did you say, I'm going to fight this? Or... or where did you go from at this Believe day? it or not, my mother said it to me. Oh, right. And uh, as a consequence, she pulled me aside one day and said, you know, Sir Patrick, you cannot stay in Belfast. You're going to have to go to another college. And um, I switched over to do medicine in the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin. Patrick, I'm going to pause there because I'd like you to pick your first piece of music this evening. Well, I suppose seeing that we're talking in terms of Northern Ireland, when I went to college first, um, because I had the wind of my sails regarding having science behind me, I didn't really have much to do for the first couple of years. So we had three lecture theatres, but we had a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. Uh, lecture theatre four was the Bailey, five was Davy Burns, and six was the Dandelion Market <laughs> beside us. And of course, in that period, 79, um, I met Bono and you too. So my first memories of Dublin coming to it in terms of wonderful universities. When you say you met them, I mean, they were at a very early stage. They must have been very young. Oh, not only that, I was in their, one of the first videos when they filmed it. And I remember in Toners, they did about 20 takes. It took us most of it a day but and I was on RTE on the Saturday morning with Dave Fanning and the lads as well and I suppose I would have grown up then with them in the pink elephant when he was coming in. And did you have any idea at the very early stages they're going to be big or? I always thought you two were going to be massive yes You, you know sort of long before even the Joshua Tree boy um, uh, yes, uh, I, I watched a documentary there recently on Shay Healy, and they showed a clip of him uh, critiquing you two, and he said, uh, "No, I don't see these guys working at all. They just don't do it for me." Are you <laughs> serious? <laughs> yeah. I was out with Googie the other night, and his brother, as you know, was on the front cover of Boy, and we were just talking about those early days, and he thought also that the, 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 the would be massive, but. In terms of Northern Ireland, I suppose the song that people would think that I should take is Sunday Bloody Sunday, which is, of course, a direct reflection on what happened on that awful day. And I was nearly involved in that. My mother again put boundaries on me. The car that came to collect me, um, she wouldn't let me get into it, which thankfully changed my life in many ways. But um, in terms, I suppose, of you two, the song that we should play is one. Uh, it is Sunshine Meets this Sunday evening. My special guest is Dr. Patrick Tracy, and this is You Two and One. Is it getting better? Or do you feel the same? Will it make it easier on you now? You got someone to blame. One love, one life When it's one need in the night One love, we get to share it Please you, baby, if you don't care
Sunshine 106.8 this Sunday evening with Joe Harrington. My special guest is Dr. Patrick Tracy. And great choice, Patrick. One from you too. We heard that just before the break. I suppose we need to move on and talk about you becoming a doctor. You also had a needle stick accident, which probably changed your life. You were on the Berlin Wall. I tell you, it's really interesting. Um, but let's talk about, first of all, you becoming a doctor and how that came about. OK, well, when, when I went to college originally... I had been promised a grant by Dennis Callahan's government, the Labour government, that I would that would cover my years in Queens and then another six years in the Royal College of Surgeons. But Margaret Thatcher came in to the quagmire of social discontent in Britain in 1981, and with it she brought her sort of Keynesian economics. And part of it was that they reviewed, I suppose, student grants. And what she did was say, OK, we'll give you six years rather than ten, so after my first two years in 1981, she pulled my grant. And here I was sitting in one of the most expensive medical schools in the world, stuck, not knowing what to do. Wow. So I went to Germany originally. We formed a painting company called Eurodeck. And when it seemed that that wasn't going to get enough, I suppose, funds to, to cover my college years. How much were you talking about? What, what sort I of think it was in the region of certainly maybe 20,000 a year, so it'd be maybe like three or four times that now, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed that in Germany, a sort of the same type of scam, I suppose, that was happening from Northern Ireland, people bringing in cars in the south and, and them worth twice the money. Students were bringing cars to Turkey, but they're worth four times the money. And so you could buy a car in Dortmund, drive it to Istanbul, you could buy it for two or three thousand Deutsche Marks at the time and sell it for maybe ten thousand. So it was actually a good way of making money. Now, the way that the thing worked was this, that you needed an entry stamp to come into the country and an exit stamp to leave the country. So this it said that you were in Syria. And as a consequence, you sold your car in between and you exited back out of your Syrian stamp. But the guy was, who was had this, was, this, was this legal? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly got me where I am now. Looking back, and it was quite funny from the point of view that the guy who had the stamp died. So once this became big business for people that noticed that we were making a bit of money out of it, yeah. um, the Turkish, I suppose, government copped on that the stamp was by somebody who had died three years before that or something. But at the time, certainly, it got us into an adventure. But anyway, I suppose to move on from that, I sort of exited med school and one of my first jobs was, it was the time German Street Hospital closed. Blanchetown was starting off. It was moving from a tuberculosis center into acute um, medicine in terms of emergency room. But, but w one night, a 17-year-old came in, very synodic, with an asthma attack. I needed to get some blood gases from him. And I'd taken off 10 mils of blood. And it was the days before, I suppose, we had vacutainers. So we just took them off in syringes. The patient had all his arteries were hardened so we couldn't get any blood from anywhere and he had one I suppose hidden vein that he used for mainlining himself that was up underneath a t-shirt and he thought I was looking for that so he turned around I was actually going to get arterial blood from his femoral artery and he spilled over everything and it stuck in my leg Oops. and he turned around and he said to me doctor I'm HIV positive and this was a period 1987 when they were showing advertisements on the television that if you got age of going to die it was the ones with the sort of cemeteries. So what were your first thoughts Patrick? No well I was going out with a girl in the hospital and believe it or not her friend was the nurse that was assisting me so my first thoughts were keep a cool head what am I going to do here you know so what I did was I left down the blood things where I was I went up to theatre a friend of mine was doing a hip joint in theatre and I called him out and I says okay Owen just imagine this is malignant melanoma in my leg. Cut out this area, which I'd sort of circled. No questions asked. Owen did that for me. He's since become an orthopedic surgeon. But the sister came out of theatre and she discovered what had happened. And she started shouting, you aren't double closed down theatre. She took the person who was doing the hip joint or was about to get it done out of that theatre, put them into another theatre. That was how scary it was. And this was like an emergency. This is like, uh, you know, you had to get this done. Well, very, that's very what I thought in my own mind, because yeah. there was no cure and people didn't uh, go around cutting bits out of the leg because I'm sure they didn't have needle sticks in such an acute thing. And was that the right thing to do? 
in retrospect, of course it was. I'm still here to talk, you yeah. know, because, I mean, I never see her converted, thankfully. But would you believe it that there was no counselling in those days? There was no compensation in the old Eastern Health Board. So they sent me to the Royal College of Surgeons and I had to meet a professor of, of microbiology. And she turned around and she said to me, there's 41 needle sticks in the world, but only four of them have died. I've researched this and they've all been that died IV to IM. And I turn around and says, well, I am IV to IM. Oh, God. And yeah. she lifted the note. She says, oh, my God, somebody should have told me this. And she says, honestly, these were her words. Uh, there's no hope then. You're probably going to die. And what, what, what was going through your mind? I said to her, you know, it's easy knowing you don't practice clinical medicine because your bedside manner is appalling. I, I, I want to move on uh, to your next piece of music. My choice would be David Bowie's Heroes. OK, you're listening to Sunshine Meets. My guest this evening is Dr. Patrick Tracy. And this is David Bowie and Heroes. special guest is Dr. Patrick Tracy and we've already covered his early life and his music influences from Northern Ireland, which was really interesting, very scary as well, to another period of his life when he became a doctor and then had this needle stick incident, which again was a very scary situation, Patrick. I want to talk about your time in Iraq and how you became a prisoner. And I know I'm also looking forward to a little bit later on you telling me all about how Michael Jackson walked into your clinic one evening. That's going to be really interesting. But before that, I want you to tell me about how the hell did you end up in Iraq and become a prisoner of Saddam Hussein? OK, well, I suppose in the period that I was down in New Zealand, myself and my girlfriend had sort of split up as well, which was much to my regret to an extent, but I suppose my own fault as well, um, sort of walking out of the situation. And when I was in Berlin, I got a posting to the Manal Batar Hospital doing staff health in Baghdad. That was run by Aer Lingus at the time, as you remember. And what were and conditions like? Or what, sort of, what time period are we talking about at this stage? We're talking about 1990, and in the, I suppose... Um, it, 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 it was the most eventful year in Iraq to be there. It was just after the period of the War of the Cities. But when we went there, there was still black tape on all the windows in case the missiles hit and you were This is after the, the first Gulf War, was it? Before, before the first oh, Gulf just before, War. Just before the first Before Gulf. America invaded, yes. The first time, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. And it was just after the period where he had gassed the Kurds in Alabalia. Okay. And when I read in Baghdad, Baghdad's the most wonderful city, you know what I mean? And the news was breaking in the Sunday Times that there had been a massive genocide almost of the Kurdish population, five or 6,000 having been killed in Alabalia. So with my keen interest in adventure and all the rest, one day I took a taxi and went up to that area. On the way back, we got, and I was traveling in Kurdish clothes with the Persian Marga, who were the freedom fighters of the area. And as a consequence of maybe a tip off, maybe whatever, the Iraqi uh, army pulled us over and I was held in a police sort of situation in somewhere between Erbil and Suleimani. And they gave me a year's jail sentence, but at the time they didn't transfer. But hang on a second, you're just, you're obviously the, 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 the perception was you were traveling with the Kurds, you were sympathetic with the Kurds, you were arrested by the police. Did you, yes. did you go to court? Yes. And did anybody represent you or was it, a, no. what, what sort of court was it? Or? No, no, I sort of got ripped off. But there was, there was like what they call in Germany a Schnell Richter. There was just um, about five or six um, soldiers in uniform and, and, and a judge there. And they had Could photographs. Could you speak any, any, any idea of the language or was there anyone helping you interpret it? Okay, when I was in, I suppose, the cells at night time, you'd hear people screaming, getting attacked, but they never really attacked me. And also my big fear was, for instance, I was carrying a driving license for a medicine patrol in Baghdad and it was the same driving license that 
Daphne Parrish and Fazrov Bazrov had had. And if you remember, he was beheaded. She had got a life sentence. He was the Iranian journalist that went in to take soil samples from the um, Al Masira site um, in one of the Ibn al Batar cars. So I didn't want them to join the dots there. But to cut a long story short, after about five days, a colonel came up to my cell and said, You think we're all barbarians, do you? And I said, No. And he says, we, I know James Joyce, I know Trinity College. And he took my arm up behind my back. He marched me up, I suppose, this corridor through some cells. He threw me outside a door and just started looking at me. And I asked, what about Mohammed, the taxi driver? Uh, he just looked and he didn't answer me. And then somebody else opened the door and threw me out my green rucksack and a camera that I had. And I had to do the walk of death, if you know what I mean. I had to walk through an open courtyard, a bit like Billy Hales in the sort of Midnight Express. I didn't know whether I got shot or whether I didn't. I wouldn't, but I, how, I didn't. how frightened were you? I was a bit frightened, but not terribly frightened. Um, <laughs> I, I, first of all, the experience of being in any jail would uh, frighten me. Don't mind an Iraqi jail. I mean, sometimes you have an intrinsic motivation. You're going to come out the other end OK. And I think you begin to sort of only become afraid when you when you're uncertain of the future. And I often have a sixth sense before I do things. What way one thing? But surely, we're like you, you, you if you're in an Iraqi jail, it, it, you don't get any sense that there's going to be somebody who's going to represent you. Did your family know? Did your everybody know where you were? I've travelled very extensively through Africa on my own, through the Hindu Kush on my own, and you know this. I travelled in periods when you had no texting, no mobile phones, no emails, and you make a conscious decision before you do something. You know, sort of whether you're going to do it or not. Obviously, you know, sort of, I suppose, having grown up in Northern Ireland and having had that keen sense of, I suppose, uh, apprehension rather than fear around you at, at all stages, I didn't feel that, you know, I was going to get my head cut off or something like that there. There's nothing really on and me. And was that more to do? When I know there's nothing on you, but that doesn't mean anything. I, would you say that maybe, uh, for the want of a better word, a little bit naivety in mm, that? Certainly no naivety in my behalf. <laughs> no, no, no. If you put it the other way around, when I was in that cell, if you can imagine, here was me thinking, I might never get out of here. And all the doctors and everybody in the hospital, 450 of them, are free down there and they don't even know what happened. Now, I got out of Iraq and I got Chris Duckling to bring me my gear from the hospital on the 26th of July, 1990. I went to Denmark, believe it or not, I was playing guitar in an Irish pub there um, the night after it. It was the first flight out of Europe. I then went to the Galway races August the <laughs> all 1st. Right, all right. And on August the 2nd, I was sitting watching television. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and all my friends were held as hostages. And talk about role reversal. Everything was turned around completely the other way. I was the one that was now free and they didn't get out until the following January or February. Remember the wow. period that Muhammad Ali went in and yeah. Al Sharpton and Jesse... Um, uh, exactly to sort of you know get them out but uh, you know the interesting thing is that we now look at Iraq through the eyes of ISIS and all the rest which would be now they, they would have to frighten you sure of course they would but at the time the Shiites uh, I suppose were submissive to the Sunni and the Sunni were in power now believe it or not the Sunni were very pro-Western their sons came to the Royal College of Surgeons with us and to most of the med schools in London New York and Dublin uh, their lawyers were educated here as well so actually the, sh the, the, the Sunni were not against the West of course Saddam Hussein and his evil sons were and America if they made one mistake was instead of taking out the whole Baptist regime they should have just taken out the leaders and left the infrastructure in power the yeah. people who didn't like it actually were the Iranians and the Shiites and mm. you know I cross and it's left it's still a bit of a mess Iraq isn't it oh, it's more than a mess absolutely I mean it's caused division now between Sunni and Shiite so that's what the Syrian war is about it's like I suppose two scorpions in a bottle on one side you've got um, Hamas and um, on the other side you have Al Qaeda and um, ISIS and the whole lot it's, 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 a, it's a toxic mix of course su suffice yeah, to yeah. say mm -hmm. I, I, wa I want to move on to your next piece of music absolutely and, and tell me why you've chosen this next piece of music okay well I suppose one of the things that sustained me in those days was um, a tape that my girlfriend had originally gave me which was um, Luciano Pavarotti's um, Nessun Dorman we played that on the way up through, I suppose, from Baghdad to um, Mosul, Erbil to Suleimana, as one of many tapes. I had also John Lennon and all the rest. But I had met Luciano on many occasions, on a few occasions. I was at his funeral as well at the time. So we, I, I had that sort of bond there. So as a consequence, certainly the song that I'd love to hear that would remind me of that whole period is Nessun Dorma. Okay. 
It is Sunshine Meets. Dr. Patrick Tracy is my special guest this evening. And this is Pavarotti with Nessun. <laughs> Sunshine Meets on Sunshine 106.8. My special guest this evening is Dr. Patrick Tracy. Maybe you've just tuned in. Well, you've missed an awful lot. I want to talk to you now about a particular superstar of pop music who called into your clinic one evening. Tell me about that. I suppose in the summer of 2006, rumours started to circulate in the Irish media that Michael Jackson had been sighted somewhere near Kinsale in County Cork. When I came back to the clinic, there was this African lady who later... I found out it was Grace Raramba, who was sitting waiting on me. And she told me that she had a client that she wanted me to meet that sort of liked my work and that she didn't want any press around and all the rest. And I said, fair enough, because we'd get quite a number of celebrities, I suppose, in the clinic. So we had arranged to meet on a particular night. And I just had the nurse there doing reception as well. Did you get any inkling of who it was? Well, believe me, there's a video camera outside our surgery and the nurse was looking trying to figure out who it was you know oh so this person this michael jackson was obviously standing outside your, your clinic yeah you're yeah, ringing the bell you know i, I think it's puff daddy she said <laughs> 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 so anyway the door opened and michael walked in and he was wearing his black fedora and he walked straight over to me and he shook my hand and the first thing he said to me dr tracy i'm pleased to meet you thank you for all you're doing for the people of africa that was his first words to me were you thinking back it was Michael Jackson? Like, were you really saying, God, this is Michael Jackson, or how did you feel? Yeah, Michael probably was the last person I was expecting to walk into the clinic. Yes, absolutely, because I would have expected somebody maybe to come in for derma fillers or Botox or something like that there. Yeah. You're thinking to yourself, well, what, what does he want, do you know, me and were to you, do? And were you a fan of Michael Jackson at that stage? Not or? really, and I t- told him that as well in, in a later time. No, I'd have been much more Pink Floyd, U2, Led Zeppelin type of person. But he took this magazine out of his pocket and it was an article that I'd written and won an award for professional journalist of the year on my HIV series on Africa and he started reading out evenings in Kenya are enchanting in the distance we can hear some voices from a nearby manyata there was something I'd written and uh, later on in it you know there's an eeriness about the deserted hamlets this is as it was going down through Zambia and in the restless winds stir the blue savannah grasses, I listen expectively to hear the noise of barking dogs or the distant sounds of children playing, but no sound comes. And he says to me, I cried when I read that, you know. Now, we both had an interest in, I suppose, humanitarianism, African HIV, and I thought that's what he had come to see me for. Like he's here, that he wanted us to do something together. And he went into my room first, and there was a picture of 9-11, because I'd been over there in St. Vincent's for a period just after it, not working in it per se, but I just arrived about a week after it happened. And that's St. Vincent's, Manhattan, where um, the victims had been brought. And he told me that he sort of had been in New York that night as well. So we, we started to sort of go from there, and the nurse started to chat Grace, and he started to wander around the clinic. And he was sitting in one of the rooms and he took down a dermatology book. It's about 300 pages called De Vries. And he was sitting reading it when sort of I came in because it wasn't sure still what I wanted to do. I was chatting Grace about Rwanda where she grew up and she had 
also went to Kampala. And I'd just been back from the United Nations. Bono had presented Alex Ticatino an award for HIV in Africa, and I'd been invited to that in the Sheraton. That was just a couple of weeks before that. And I had been talking to her, and I went up into the room, and Michael was there, intensely gross in this book. And he came across a picture on the page of a black African child who was black and white. And the child had vitiligo, and he turned around to me and says... What is that? Just explain that to people. What is it? Vitiligo is an autoimmune disease where your antibodies attack your own melanocytes. They think that it's bacteria, and as a consequence, they destroy them. So you get these massive patches of white. And he turned around to me and he says to me, Patrick, he says, nobody understands the pain that this child is going through. And I was saying, OK, thinking to myself, what do you want me for, you know? And then he pulled up his leg and I seen there was black and white, you know, and I realized, oh, my God, look at here. And he says, can you treat that? And I said, yeah, I can certainly camouflage it. So Michael had come to us during that period also. He was using pigmentation, things on his skin, but because of an underlying skin condition, not because he necessarily wanted to turn white. The thing was that there was, I suppose, a small tear in his eye. And what, he did, he, what did he actually want? What, 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 what did he actually come t- to you for? Was it well, for within to get the confines treatment? of medical, I suppose, confidentiality, there's some things I can mention and some things I can't. No, obviously. So I mean, things that would be known, I, I, I can mention. Okay. Yeah, I don't mean specifically, what, but, but did he come <clears> to, for you to treat him? Or yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, 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 he came for me to treat him. I suppose, if I remember, some of it was actually a bit shocking. One day he was in with me and Michael was here for quite a period and I treated him after he'd left as well. So how long was mm. he in Ireland for? And he was in Ireland that I was aware about seven months from about the June to, of 2006 through to maybe the December when James Brown died and the family left that Christmas. Wh- and wh- wh- how long was he in Ireland before he came to you? I was in a few months down with Michael Flatley and down in Cork. So he came to me mostly when he had moved to Grouse Manor in County Westmeath, where he was doing a recording yeah. with Will I Am, and uh, so he came to Ireland as a sort of bolt hole and escape. Why Ireland? Why Ireland? I mean, well, in least. many ways, it was the perfect place. The first thing he had young children that he wanted to bring up and have them educated. The second thing he wanted to get away from the media. The third thing he wanted an English speaking country, and the fourth thing I think he just wanted peace. You know, he was a creative genius. Michael certainly wanted to record another album, and he did record one. And Will I Am came over and. Grass Lodge, as you know, Paddy done a wonderful job, I suppose, setting recording studios there and bringing over some very famous named acts that sort of have been there before Michael. But Michael, I suppose, wanted just some time out. He was very confused, very paranoid in that period as well. He thought people were out to get him, to possibly even kill him. And we certainly had one or two conversations regarding that late at night time. One day he was at the clinic with me. We was treating the vitiligo on his leg and we had said that we'd do a concert in Africa for HIV humanitarianism. He says to me, I'll get some people that will help you in Africa. Look, it's here, you know. And I says, OK, fair enough. And one day when I'm putting this thing on his leg and it's sort of going to go hard, it's a compound called Amelon. He says to me, here's somebody that'll help you. And I says, look at doing this. So I'm balancing the phone on my shoulder. If you don't come out, I says, hi, how are you? And he says, I'm fine. Um, you're helping Michael. And I says, yeah, I'm helping Michael. And he says, Michael is a very good friend of mine. And I says, OK, good. I says, you want to help us with the concert, do you? And he says, I'll help you with the concert, yeah. And I turned around and says, you sound South African. Are you in Cape Town? I used to live there. He says, yes, I'm in Cape Town. Where did you live? I says, Bantry Bay in Clifton. And I'm saying to Michael, get him off the phone because, look, at this stuff's going to go hard. You know, like it's here, you know. Mm. And he says, no, no, talk away, talk away. So I'm talking away anyway, and we're just blowing the breeze with okay. each other, you know, not really getting into much detail. Mm. So I give Michael back the phone, and he says to me then, that was Mad- Madiba. You know, and I said, Madiba, what's Madiba? He says, my grandfather, Madiba. And I said, what, Nelson Mandela? <laughs> and he says, yeah, so I went to get back the phone and he wouldn't give it back to me. Like, it's here and he's laughing, you know, and he says his son will help us. That, that's an amazing thing. Look, we, we, we need to finish up now, Patrick, mm-hmm. because we'd be here for another hour if I had to really talk to you about all the, the various sure. things. But I'd like you to pick your final piece of music. Well, I suppose in terms of humanitarianism, and of course, Michael gave most of his money away to humanitarian ideals. The fans, after Michael had died, formed the Michael Jackson legacy, and they open orphanages around the world. And I've been very privileged. They've asked me to open orphanages in Ebola, Hitna, Monrovia, and Liberia. And what I'd like to do is play 
man in the mirror. I suppose it really brings it all down to brass tacks. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. No message would have been any clearer. I want to make the world a better place. Take a look at yourself and make the change. So I suppose it's the change within. If we want to help others, we have got to change ourselves first and have that attitude. So certainly Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson, I think, would be nice to finish the Okay. interview okay it's been an absolute pleasure uh, Patrick really really enjoyed the interview this evening and thank you very much for joining us my pleasure I want to make a change for once in my life it's gonna feel real good gonna make a difference gonna make it right as i turn up the collar on my favorite winter coat this wind is blowing my mind i see the kids in the street but not enough to eat who am i to be blind